This weekend, our show features two of our great Mises Institute summer fellows this year, uh, Sasha Klaka, who is a German but is in a PhD program at a university in Sweden, and Louis Rone, who is a very young and promising up-and-coming academic who is finishing his master's program at Sciences Po University in Paris. So it's a bit of an inside baseball discussion for people who like Austrian economics and are interested in the role of academics in it. We'll talk to these two young men about how they see the Mises Institute and what it ought to be doing, what its role is, their future or potential future as academics in Europe. And we discuss at length whether they're optimistic or pessimistic about what's happening in Europe in terms of academic freedom, in terms of culture and politics. So it's really a fascinating interview with two very bright young men, both of whom I'm sure are going to make a name for themselves in academia going forward. So stay tuned. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Mises Weekends. Once again, I'm your host, Jeff Dice. Very pleased to be joined today by two of our Mises Institute summer fellows, Sasha Klaka and Louis Rone, uh, a German and a Parisian. Uh, well, not a Parisian. You're from the southern part of France, yeah. but studying in, in Paris. And Sasha, you're, you're an, a, a PhD candidate in a PhD program in Sweden. So welcome to both of you, and thanks for taking the time today. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. Well, so I want to start out with a sort of a devil's advocate question. Obviously, uh, Murray Rothbard was a big believer in a multi-pronged approach, and we are as well. But, but what would you say to the criticism that going into academia as a way to promote or spread Austrian or libertarian ideals is, is not the best approach? We ought to be focusing on the layperson and that academia is so hopelessly lost uh, to uh, authoritarian or left-wing thought that it's, it's a waste of time. Yeah, I think it's it's not quite true. Um, having studied African studies development now going into economic history, I think there's actually, especially in those more fringe fields, a lot more uh, lively debate as compared to perhaps economics, which is very dominated by the mainstream. And uh, yeah, people are not blind. And in the development field, you can see how not much is working, especially with regard to to African development. So people are looking for different ideas. People get more and more skeptical of uh, state intervention, of central planning, of large-scale social engineering. So I think, yeah, they're coming with our ideas of yeah, spontaneous order or, you know, bottom-up uh, human action-driven economy and economic development, economic processes um, can find a fruitful ground to, to flourish there. Yeah, I, I think uh, economic history is actually a good way to go for Austrians because you can talk with uh, the mainstream without appearing like a crazy. Um, the t theoretical differences don't play that much. And you can talk with other heterodox. You know, Marxist historians are actually pretty good in, in many subjects. They they are more rigorous and also they like take care of the poor people, like the real people. And they are not like pro-business, pro-big business and pro-cronies, actually. So we can talk with them, too. And so, yeah, I think that it's great that the position that uh, uh, Sasha got. And uh, I actually myself is pretty interested by economic history. Well, let me ask you this. For both of you personally, individually, how did you make the decision or why did you decide to come and be a fellow for a summer at, at the Mises Institute. What, how is this going to help you? So me, I came last year and I was so pleased with it that I decided to, to come back this year, sort of like reveal preference of uh, how valuable is uh, the program here. Um, for my, the third year of my, master, uh, of my bachelor, sorry, I had to go abroad. That's part of the program. And uh, I asked doc, Dr. Hulsman, who is uh, teaching in Angers in France, and uh, he supported my application. And I spent seven months here last year doing research in, in economic history of thought and on many other subjects. And it was very enriching. And uh, that actually uh, furthered my envy to continue in the academia because I think you have a very valuable way to contribute to the debate. And uh, yes, it's very important to discuss with everybody and uh, every every man. But uh, you also have to do some academic call work. Uh, theoretical foundations are really important if we want to structure and have rational debate and arguments. Yeah, for me, um, 
I've been working on being a fellow here for, for a few years now. Um, I came to Mises University 2013, the first time I really enjoyed it, and uh, came a second time in 2014, and yeah, saw already, I mean, you know so, a lot of the things, and you see where you can go more into detail and more into depth. So I figured, yeah, the, the fellowship is great for doing that, doing your own research, learning uh, more yeah, in-depth Austrian economics, see what are the current research problems, have a time to focus on on a project here. Um, last year, it didn't work out for me to come, but I was at the Rothbard Graduate Seminar, which was a fantastic experience and yeah, showed me also the breadth of the discussion that actually exists uh, within Austrian economics on certain theoretical theoretical issues. And yeah, I finished my master's program last year, going to start my PhD now. So it was nice to also come here, work already on a little project that I might be able to present, just get back into the whole research, academic writing. Um, and yeah, the context uh, I made during the Rothbard Graduate Seminar, during Mises U, the context with other fellows, um, they're just uh, invaluable. Um, and there's no other place like like the institute and no other program like the fellowship um, anywhere. Yeah, actually achieves so many so many things in such a short time. I think it's also a great human experience that you learn what humility is really is because like during RGS this year it was on human action with Dr. Ulsman, Dr. Herbener, uh, and all the faculty, Dr. Saleno, and we spent one week on human action a book that we have read, most of us, before. And uh, you have so much to discover in this book, in one week, in a book that you actually already read. And you didn't get, actually, all the subtleties, etc. It's, it's a very hard book. You have a lot of uh, things in it. And so it really teaches us that you actually... We don't all agree on what exists as Austrians. We have discussions. Sometimes we don't really understand what's uh, written in human action. So you have to spend a lot of time thinking and uh, admit that you don't understand something. So I think that's great. And that's only at the Mises Institute that you can do that. You have so much material. The massive library is just amazing. I, the first year I was here, I was running all around the Mises Institute, asking questions to everybody. It was a wonderful uh, experience. Well, for our listeners, a lot of people might not know, and we're you know we're being self-promotional here. That's fine. A lot of people might not know that in addition to Mises.org, we actually have a physical library here in a, in a large physical campus. We have about fifty thousand volumes, which makes us one of the largest private libraries in the entire Southeast U.S. And we also have active research going on here. So we're not just a website. Um, it really is a unique organization, a unique building uh, in that sense. Um, but on that, and, and be, be critical, don't, don't hold back. You know, how, what do you think the role of the Mises Institute ought to be in, in, a, in a broad sense? And do you think we're, we're, we're fulfilling that role or, or how are we falling down? Is the Mises Institute doing a good job? Uh, I'd certainly say so. Um, going back to your initial uh, question also on this two-pronged strategy of you know, promoting liberty more for the lay people or uh, focusing on academia, I think the Mises Institute found a really good balance uh, by now. And I've been, I've been following the work of the Institute and uh, the Mises website for, I don't know, eight years at least now. Uh, I think you found a very good balance, you know, having the Mises wire now with a lot of more accessible um, articles on current topics, having Mises uh, University, which is more introductory, but then also focusing on on people at the Rothbard Graduate Seminar and in the fellowship, you know, try to find amongst all the people who are a bit interested in Austrian economics and libertarianism, those who really want to pursue an academic career and help them really take it to the, to the next level. And then, yeah, be the be new professors, join faculties all over all over the United States, all over the world. A lot of former fellows have been here uh, this year, giving lectures, giving presentations, uh, you know, networking with us, having a beer with us in a discussion on their research, our research. So I think it's it's a really good strategy because, of course, of the 150 people who come here uh, for for Mises, you not everybody wants to wants to pursue an academic career, or perhaps yeah, only a tiny fraction. And I think you found a very good balance. Well, you have some think tanks that uh, 
focus on policy and uh, that's not the Mises Institute, right? It's uh, just education and academic all work, but also education for the uh, wider public. And uh, it's very hard to do because it's two different uh, works, like the academic work and uh, writing for the everyday man. But I think it's great. I mean, I, I came to the Mises Institute as just a curious uh, young uh, student a few years ago. And just I remember me downloading almost every book that was on the Mises Institute uh, website and reading them and uh, thinking about all this, reading articles. And uh, I mean, that really played a major role in my intellectual development. So I guess it's working, at least for me. <laughs> Well, let me ask you this, uh, talking a little bit more about Europe, because you're both Europeans. Um, Austrian economics has a foothold of sorts in the U.S., in academia, places like George Mason, Grove City, uh, individual professors like Peter Klein, uh, scattered uh, universities across the country. Do you feel like Austrian economics has a foothold in European academia, or is it really still something that's lost? Mm, yeah, I think it does not have a very strong foothold in uh, European academia. I think it's even very unknown that the modern day uh, Austrian school exists. So if you mention something, well, of course, it's Menger and Brimbavec and Wiese. Um, some people, of, well, most people know Hayek. Some people might know uh, Mises. But uh, yeah, in terms of uh, German Austrian academics, uh, or European Austrian academics, they're very few. They're not very well connected. So Th this is their tradition. Why are a bunch of Americans uh, carrying water for a, a, an Austro-Hungarian German tradition? Well, I guess that's a bit the fault of the Germans and the Second World War um, that this school, well, most most German language schools of thought, I think, kind of died out, except for for more left wing schools. And yeah, they haven't been able to come back from, from their, their exile over here and establish a firm foothold again. Well, Louis, obviously the French have a, a liberty tradition. And, and where does it stand? Yeah, of course. Um, as for Austrians, uh, I think despite everything, we still have some Austrian scholars in France. You have some in Troy, uh, in France, in Angers, of course, with Dr. Hulsman, in South of France, in Aix-en-Provence. You have after like some professors that were former fellows, um, Xavier Mera, etc. And uh, that's great. I mean, it's developing. It's slow. It's a slow process. But uh, despite everything, uh, we believe we're on the right side. So we just do our work and that's what we should do. We should not care about if we are in the minority or not. We should not victimize ourselves and just do good work and it will be fine. Yeah, I think even though we are way behind the United States in terms of number of Austrian scholars or percentage of Austrian scholars in how well known libertarianism, classical liberalism or Austrian economics are, there's places also like uh, Universidad Rey Juan Carlos in, in Madrid. And I've heard some people say it's really difficult to get into the master's program in Austrian economics by now because there's such a huge interest in it. In uh, Prague this year, um, I was at the... Uh, several institutes, which is a private university, also focusing on on Austrian economics. So, yeah, it's establishing itself slowly, and it certainly is growing. When Students for Liberty, which I am a member of, came in Europe, they took a map and they said, "Well, France, no, doesn't even matter to try; it won't happen." And now, Students for Liberty, one of the strongest countries, France, because you have young. Um, students or young scholars that are really interested by the ideas of liberty, but also by Austrian economics to, to really understand the world and they think it's unsatisfactory what they learn in school and in universities. So they find an alternative way and it's working very well. We have um, an amazing group of students in France uh, that are Austro-Libertarians or just Libertarians. And uh, I think I'm pretty optimistic about this. It will continue to go well. Well, in the U.S., the, the view of academia for a lot of people is that it is uh, hopelessly ideological and authoritarian, it's illiberal, and that it, it exists to pursue or promote an agenda rather than to do real academic work, truth-seeking, we might say. Um, do you think that the state of academic freedom in European universities is greater or less than here? Um, it's 
difficult to say, especially you know, on a European, like for for Europe, uh, every country is different. Uh, a lot of universities are are very different. So I have, yeah, I don't have a good uh, good overview, but I've studied personally in Germany, Spain, and Denmark. So far, Denmark, at, at least at my my department in African studies, there was a phenomenal degree of uh, academic freedom. Um, I was coming doing research from an Austrian perspective. My professors, some of them were coming from more of a Marxist tradition of research, and of course there were disagreements, but not any any real conflicts. And so nobody said, "Okay, what you're doing, you can't do this because mm -hmm. uh, because you're wrong based on like an ideological judgment or anything." So I think there is. Uh, in a lot of places, you know, free research, as long as it's good research, um, is is encouraged, and there's not one one strong general agenda necessarily. But uh, I can't speak, of course, for all the all the social sciences or for economics. I can't really say much about this. I think there, it's it's more closed off. Do you think the hostility toward market solutions for development in Africa and and other uh, third world countries. Do you think that's starting to crumble and people are starting to understand? Apparently, even Bono from U2 uh, said recently at Georgetown, that, you know, capitalism is going to bring more people out of poverty than aid. Um, yeah, I think it. the acceptance starts growing, especially because the whole state solution, external planning, uh, Western countries giving aid and deciding for for African countries, for African people, what they have to do, what is the best way. It's not been working uh, for for decades, oftentimes it's made things worse. So people look for alternatives. I think for the acceptance of the market uh, per se, uh, what is lacking is yeah is the Austrian approach to it because our understanding of the market, of course, is completely different to to a neoclassical understanding, which is what most people would be familiar with. So when I talk about you know we should value uh, people's subjective valuations, we should uh, respect their subjective choices, we should focus on what they want to do and uh, all these kind of things, they they resonate pretty strongly. And if I tell them more, that's actually what the market is about. They, sometimes they cannot wrap their head around it still because because there's too much of okay there's these market forces and then people are just uh, well like Hayek in his famous rap video um says yeah, chess man you move on a board or like little clocks in a machine that runs through like some forces so it's it's still difficult to come in uh, to tell people what is the market really about and how can that help uh, africans um you know take their fate into their own hands and develop how is this compatible also with the concerns um, the more traditional views of of development, economic development have. Um, but yeah, I'm, I, I'll dedicate my life trying to to yeah bring this in there, and I think it's it's working okay already. There's a, you see more and more people taking a more free market uh, perspective, or at least being critical of government intervention. On this subject, I would like to say that in the 80s, you had some very good development also in development economics. For example, somebody like Peter Bauer was liked very much Hayek and Mises. In one of his books, uh, I remember him writing something like, uh, if you are a graduate student, don't read Mises and Hayek before having finished your PhD, because it will change your mind so much that uh, <laughs> you will have a hard time afterwards. But uh, after the about this mechanical view of the mar markets, it's there that Austrians are really different. For Austrians, uh, human action, uh, every man uh, is a sort of an entrepreneur in every action he undertakes, and it's a real cause of market phenomena. And uh, yeah, that's very different than sort of this mechanical view of equilibrium that is reached almost automatically. No. Uh, you have entrepreneurs doing the job. And I think that uh, you have a renewal in um, development economics for like the entrepreneurs with people bringing solutions, not governments, but people just seeing a problem and saying, this is a solution, let's do it with their own fund, uh, with responsibility and free markets. You know, Louis, the, the news we get in the US about Europe and about France in the last few years has tended to be bad. We hear a lot about debt crises. Uh, we hear a lot about uh, immigration crises and, and re more recently, some terrorist events. What's your sense as a young person 
of France's future and Europe's future. Are you optimistic about living and working in Europe or are you, you pessimistic that, that statism, that the, the, the form of nationalism that seems to be growing is going to be statist nationalism and that the future for Europe is rocky? I mean, you always have this tension, right, between statism and more freedom. It's always existed. It will probably exist for a long time after us. But uh, so you always have this pessimistic view and this optimistic view. You have some great development in our world. We live in a world with great material wealth and some really clear progress. At the same time, yes, our governments are doing really, really bad policies. And it's quite impressive sometimes to think that they can... <laughs> do this. Like those past five years in France, you had a lot of complaints with taxes, for example, with uh, regulations. But still, things are changing. For example, uh, the left, you have a new movement in the left and Socialist Party in France, where they are more free market. They are not free market, but they have some good directions. And so therefore, it pushes the right wing party more to the right, saying, well, we have to reduce the state budget by uh, 100 billion uh, euros or something. I don't think they will do it, but still, those developments are interesting. Um, so, I mean, yes, you have the migrant crisis. That's unfortunate, and uh, it's really badly managed by also our governments. Uh, like putting people in camps is like the stupidest ideas that they could have done. It creates tension. It creates nationalism. Um, but still, you have uh, other good developments. I think Brexit, I was pretty enthusiastic by it, that it counter attack uh, against Brussels, that uh, expanded and expanded some of its powers. I don't think they would be able to do that now because you have strong nationalist movement in, everywhere in Europe. People don't want uh, this centralized Europe, federal Europe. And I, I think it's a good thing because uh, we always had had two visions of Europe, so decentralized, uh, polycentric Europe, where you have competition between states and people just vote with their feet, going where they believe uh, they can have a better life. And the centralized Europe, where you are going to force people with their differences, but still you are going to force them in one centralized uh, political entity, which is completely fictitious and is not working. I mean, today, I don't think people really want it. Uh, for those reasons, I think you can be optimistic about Europe. We still live in a wonderful continent with a lot of diversity, cultural wealth, a good way of life. Even though we have problems, uh, the terrorist attacks, the last one was very near my hometown. Uh, it have affected me very much, so I, I'm not sure I'm ready to talk about this, but... Uh, that's life and you have to go on and do your best to advance freedom and uh, progress. Sasha, let me ask, do you think that the centralizers, that Brussels, the technocrats will ultimately prevail or will the, uh, the, the separate identities of, of European nations prevail? I, I think the, the bureaucrats in the EU and the top politicians in the European uh, countries of the mainstream parties, they will try to force like still continue forcing the centralization agenda. But as Louis already said, um, yeah, nationalism is rising. I'm very sad about it because for me, it's not the choice between uh, Europe under the rule of the European Union or a Europe of strong national identities and nation states. It's more a Europe, like like Louis said, a decentralized, polycentric uh, Europe of yeah people with their national identity, but also with a strong European identity, only living together and cooperating and intermingling trading voluntarily and not through force. Why can't we have that in the U.S.? Yeah. Amongst <laughs> our states as well. Well, in the U.S. it's particularly acute because we have 320 million people under one highly centralized government and you have vast cultural and regional and economic and social and, and, and ethnic and all, all kinds of differences. But look, I know to an extent I'm asking you questions that are unanswerable, but I, I'm just for your thoughts. Um, so we have time for one final question, and I'll pose it to both of you. The, the great liberal tradition of the Enlightenment, of, of Locke, of Hume, came from Europe. It's a European Enlightenment, and I don't think we can, we can hang our hat on that, but not, neither should we run from that. Do you think it will take a conflagration of sorts for Europe to ever return 
to a liberal mindset or a liberal outlook, or or is there something short of a conflagration that could return Europe to the kind of place that we think of it historically, a, a liberal place? I think if the classic liberal, libertarian, Austrian movement picks up speed and, you know, the people rediscover liberalism, that there is actually, I mean, as you said, there's a liberal tradition, like liberalism is of interest to a lot of people, like Students for Liberty are doing so well in, also in countries like France and Germany, where you'd say, okay, that's not really the place you would think of when you say liberal countries uh, in the European sense. Um, But they're getting a lot stronger, a lot I mean, here the fellows, almost every year, half of them are Europeans who want to go back to Europe, who want to go into academia, spread these ideas. There's a lot of conferences. We ourselves organize a conference for graduate students to present their research, uh, which gets more and more interest every year. So people want to, and I mean, it's kind of a race you know, between when is the EU, like, when does it reach the breaking point? Are the liberals strong enough, the real liberals strong enough to yeah, either pick up the pieces or are we strong enough to prevent a, a collapse, or an unordered collapse and manage to go back to something more sustainable than we have now? Um, I, I really can't, I really can't say. And I mean, stuff like well, even the Soviet Union, you know, Mises said it's unworkable and it proved unworkable, but it managed for 80 years. So it might be that the European Union hangs on for another 20, 30 years somehow. And then we have enough time to to build up our moment because people get more and more dissatisfied. Our ideas are getting more and more attractive. If it you know collapses uh, in the next five years, yeah, I, I would not like to see that because then it's going to be the nationalists uh, and the, the right wing who are going to pick up the pieces. And then it's going to be even harder to rebuild like a liberal uh, vision of Europe. So to put it in a historical perspective, you talked about John Locke. Uh, I'm, I'm reviewing a, uh, a book by one of my friends, Vincent de Gournay, who is the one who coins the uh, sentence laissez-faire. A funny thing is that this thought, you know, laissez-faire, radical uh, free market uh, thinking, appeared after 50 years of uh, total expansion of, of state power uh, over the economy with Colbert uh, uh, during Louis XIV. And you had all those circles of intellectual coming together and finding ideas about freedom and expanding them. And after you have Turgo being a minister of Louis XVI, and after you have more and more thinkers and you have this great uh, French classical liberal tradition. So I think to a certain extent, we have a rise of statism uh, um, those past uh, 50 years or after the Second World War. And uh, now you have uh, a renewal in the interest of uh, free market ideas, uh, liberal, true liberalism. Uh, and um, th- that's why I think we should, you know, just work for it, go for it and not victimize ourselves. And I think it will be fine. Well, maybe we should just wrap this up by saying the future is unwritten and it's up to us. We're not fatalists. We're, we're libertarians. So Sasha Klaka and Louis René, thank you so much for your time. And, and uh, we loved having you here this summer and safe travels back to Europe. Thank you.